It's a scam, man. Dr. Rachel Southard, being a doctor is hard, parentheses, residency, mental health. Let's see what's going on. This morning we have a total abdominal hysterectomy, which will be really exciting. Put my scrub cap on. It's from Etsy if you're curious. Gotta get the scrub cap. My favorite was Batman. <laughs> I just had one procedure today and it was a total abdominal hysterectomy and also a DNC. I am so scared to perforate the uterus or, you know, like go through it with an instrument because it is so easy to do. However, I have a restriction in my hand and I'm trying to see a hand surgeon. Um, if, if there's any hand surgeons watching or if you know anyone who's a hand surgeon and want to show them this video, please. That would have been me if I continued my training. I have a tendon tie in my right hand, which is my dominant hand. When we're doing like cervical checks or stuff like that, in my right hand, I can't do that. If you just look at this, so this is my extension on my right hand and this is my dominant hand, like I said, versus this one. So it is like significantly restricted. And then if I want to extend all the way, this, my ring finger has to like extend too because if I don't, it just comes back down. I feel that's also why I've gotten to be more ambidextrous and I don't have a preference when the surgeons are like, hey, which hand are, is your dominant hand? And I'm like, oh, I my right, but then I end up doing a lot of things with my left hand and I have no preference. And I think it's because of this restriction to where I have compensated to learn how to do things with my left hand. Yeah, a lot of people think that you either are right-handed, left-handed or ambidextrous, but you can train these things. So when I was in residency and, or actually even in med school, I was taking this probably more seriously than I needed to, but I would do things with my left hand on purpose. I would brush my teeth with my left hand. I would pick up the milk carton and pour it with my left hand. I would try to do a lot of random things with my left hand. And of course, practicing your surgical ties with the left hand as well. It actually makes a big difference. Good morning, you guys. Another day, another test of my will to continue to get up every day. Just kidding. It's doing great today. It's Tuesday, <laughs> doing gyne-onc procedures today. Oh my God, what is this? Nice. Oh my god, you guys. I'm looking at my loans right now because I have to start paying them back, I think, in a few months. I cannot even believe. <laughs> Look at this number. You won't believe this. 360. So osteopathic med students, those who graduate from DO programs, they tend to have higher loan burdens. The average from the AMC is 241000 as of 2021 and allopathic is 194,000. And then the crazy thing that blew my mind, me and many of my, my fellow friends' minds in med school, was that only like 70 to 75% of students graduate with loans, which means that more than a quarter have no student loans at all. It is crazy how much medical school costs, but then the amount of salary that you get as a resident it isn't, it just doesn't compare at all. I think new hires at Target, at least where I saw their hiring sign, I think their minimum per hour is more than what we get. And that's kind of concerning. You know, not that a Target employee is any less value than a resident physician in the United States, but uh, it's a little bit different. It's a little bit different. It's a scam, man. By just saying that it's your training and that's why we pay you so little, they get away with paying residents essentially minimum wage, sometimes even less. Yet the hospitals get subsidies from the government and they use residents as just cheap labor to do the things that they would have to pay other people to normally do. I haven't really talked to you guys at all today just because I've actually had a really hard day. It has everything to do with work. It's nothing, nothing that happened in particular. I think it's just more so today because I had a little bit more time to actually think about it, um, but about how my mental health is actually doing and how I actually feel on the inside. And I noticed that I keep it together really well throughout the day so I can learn, so I can be present for patients, so I can be focused. Um, obviously we are working with real human human lives and I, I really understand that and I that's why I really do a fantastic job of keeping it together but then when I'm driving home and I actually am talking about my day to even like my parents I just realize the words that I'm saying and I'm like that is not probably the happiest person <laughs> yeah it's just kind of sad to be completely honest and I never really understood how residents would feel when I was a med student and how they would kind of describe how much they hated being a resident and I would be like, why? That's like the greatest thing ever and it's everything you've ever wanted. And it's hard to talk about this. I wanna be so transparent and honest with you guys, but obviously I have to bite my tongue with some certain things. 
um, and, and be like professional and I know that people watch my channel and stuff like that and I don't want to draw the wrong attention and, and maybe somehow not be able to use this as a space for me to, to have a platform anymore. As a physician in the US, you do have to be very careful with these things. Um, part of that is with social media and programs can get upset, they can terminate residents or med students, or even attending physicians. And the other part is that in the US, even prior to social media, you have to be very careful with mental health issues because that can influence your ability to practice. I love my program. I love the hospital that I'm at. I love the team that I'm a part of. It has nothing to do with that. It is just the this idea about how being a fourth year med student, you have so much freedom and that freedom, that taste of freedom is liberating. <laughs> it is so dangerous and it's so painful to part from to now being a residence. You're being like a free range bird or chicken and now you're caged. Now I recently learned that free range is a little bit of a misleading term and you actually want pasture raised chicken. <laughs> Things that you found joy in that were so grand and wonderful and you're like, of course that would bring you joy. That's the most beautiful experience ever. Now my joyous moments are diminished to these small little things and the things that people would take for granted because they get to experience these things every day, but yet maybe like I don't. So during your fourth year of med school, the first half you're doing sub internships in your specialty. And those tend to be pretty challenging, especially in things like surgery, ob um, I do have some friends that did some more relaxed rotations in internal medicine, but it's very variable. But you're doing sub internships and away rotations in the first half, and then you apply in September and you're doing interviews after that and that can be very busy and hectic and traveling and managing your schedule. But the second half, let's say Jan Feb, up until you start residency, super chill and you don't have that many rotations to attend. A lot of people go on vacation. That's the freedom she's referring to. I don't wanna sound like I'm complaining because this just is what it is and this is how my life is, but gosh, I, I really wish that there was more of a balance. But essentially, I don't wanna be depressed but I feel like I am. <laughs> it is what it is and things will be what they'll be and, and I'm just here and doing the best that I can. I don't even know if this will make it into the vlog, but I don't want to be afraid to talk about my mental health or anything like that because of fear of backlash or fear of what people will think about me as a doctor. This is really challenging stuff and kudos to her for talking about this. It's really unfortunate that residency training should be really optimized to focus on the residents learning their education, becoming the best possible attending physician that they can be. But money rules the world. And unfortunately, what programs ultimately do is they use residents more as cheap labor rather than for educational purposes. And I remember when I was an intern, there were a lot of things that we, we had an NP who oftentimes just like didn't show up. And there were things that she was supposed to do that when she didn't show up, we just had to do. And a lot of these tasks, they're just scut work. They're busy work. They're things that the hospital should be paying someone else to do, whether it's a mid-level or a nurse or whoever. But hey, the resident's there and the residents are cheaper. I'm a person too, you know? I'm a person just as much as anyone else is, just as much as any patient. I just wanna be whole and I wanna recognize that how I feel right now and the words I say and describe my day to others and how I'm actually feeling. I do recognize that it's not the healthiest and I'm not in the best place. Check in with yourself, check in with your people. Are you okay? Are you checking in? I'm doing my check-in. I don't know what I'm gonna do about it um, because I don't have time to do things about it. Um, and how sad is that? It's, it's like really challenging to even see someone, to see a professional therapist when you're feeling this way. And depending on the rotation, it can, it can be impossible. So um, focusing on mental health is really, really a top, top priority because if that isn't right, then everything else that follows is gonna be compromised. Your ability to learn, and then depending on the severity, eventually all the way to compromising your care, right? So we should be caring a lot about this because how doctors are doing directly influences how we as patients receive care, but systemic issues. Today was just not good. It just wasn't good. It wasn't a good day and I'm really trying to um, have a positive outlook and be happy and look for happy things, but uh, I'm not happy right now still. <laughs> and by all means, I don't want you guys to like worry about me or, you know, you don't have to have like sympathy or empathy for me. <laughs> like it just, it is what it is. And I, I just want to document this and show you. Residency's hard. It's, it's hard. And I feel like it's, 
it needs to be talked about more how hard it is because you just have no clue what you're getting into. You have not a single clue. A lot of pre-meds have no idea. They just have this idea of what a doctor is like and what it means to be one based on TV shows, Grey's Anatomy, Scrubs, whatever it is. And that's why we focus so heavily on educating people because it's a great profession, but it's not for everyone. And there's ups and downs. There are gonna be more challenging weeks or even months, depending on your rotations. And there's times when you love it, there's times when you're like, damn, I can barely stay afloat. And that's unfortunately just a very common experience for those who are training to become physicians. I'm not even tired. I'm just emotionally drained. It's seven o'clock, I'm on my floor because I'm disgusting and I'm writing an op note. I can't like enter my house because it's just, I literally am gross. I probably have dermoid cysts splashed on my leg. I do, it's disgusting. By the way, I recommend uh, just, well, generally you want to wear hospital scrubs, not like your fancy figs when you're in the OR, but I recommend just going to the locker room and then really quickly just exchanging your dirty scrubs for new scrubs before you head home. Quick little thing, it takes two minutes, but sometimes you run out of time. I'm realizing residency is going to be like this and it's not going to just be happy, happy, happy and I have to get used to that and just learn how to cope and learn how to make sure that I'm okay. I do love medicine. I love the things that we get to do. I love all of the learning. I love the impact that we get to have on people's lives. And so I couldn't be doing anything else. There is nothing that else that I would rather do than be a physician. And so this is just kind of what it takes to do that. Kudos to Rachel for making this video and discussing a topic that's very difficult and being so vulnerable about it. So it's something that I care very deeply about. I've seen a lot of colleagues, whether in med school and in residency, um, struggle with this stuff. And we started this whole Save Our Doctors initiative, which we do want to bring back at some point that focuses on mental health for med students and resident physicians. And I recall one month in my intern year, the one that was the most challenging was where I had a flare up of my IBD. My IBD flare-ups extremely, I was very well managed. And that was essentially the second one I had in several years. And it was really challenging. And I remember during that flare, it was like a flare up and I was working 14 to 16 hours, three days in a row. The middle one was my birthday. And I remember being annoyed. I was like, dude, it's my birthday. I just want to go by myself, grab some Thai food, sit at the restaurant and relax, but I can't. I got to rush home, sleep, prepare for the next day's cases. And things can be tough and we're not gonna fix the system overnight. So what are the actual practical pieces of advice that we can implement? So the biggest one that makes the greatest difference is really improving time management. And it's gonna depend on the specialty. Some are gonna work you harder than others, but for the most part, you're working 80 hours or fewer per week. And I say for the most part because there are some specialties that violate that 80 hour restriction, neurosurgery. And most other specialties are gonna work you around 80 or fewer hours. I know when I was in plastics, it averaged out to 80, sometimes a little bit more, oftentimes it was a little bit less. And while that's a lot of time, 80 hours, two full-time jobs per week, realize that if you are really intentional about your time management, you can definitely do it. And people might be upset, hey, we gotta change the system, but again, the system is not changing in the way or at the pace that we want it to. So in the meantime, we have to do things to help us out, to keep ourselves afloat, right? So. Number one, I would say is really focus on sleep. I got obsessed with sleep, even as a med student, I made this video up here, which went viral, really high yield video on sleep tactics because your duration is gonna be limited in med school and in residency, but if you improve the quality, that does a lot to improve the restoration from sleep. Another thing is exercise, of course, a lot of benefits. I would cycle to and from the hospital. I actually got a, a little town home close to the hospital. I paid maybe an extra two or $300 per month because I knew if I was further, it's not feasible to actually cycle. So I got close enough where I could cycle within about 10, 12 minutes each way. And then I also found a gym on the way where I could swing by from the hospital if I was really out of time, you know, sometimes even in scrubs and get a quick workout and do some strength training too. And then there's finally nutrition. And I think meal prep services are godsend for busy residents because you probably don't have time to cook yourself. And if you rely on just takeout, doing fast food or whatever, that's something you're gonna wanna avoid too. And of course, staying socially connected and having that social support system, your friends, your family, keep in touch with them. There's gonna be times in residency where it's tougher than others, but that's really important for your mental health too. And the final piece of advice is don't make it harder than it needs to be. This is advice for anyone who's like me, where you wanna do a surgical residency, which is already challenging enough, 
and then you wanna script and animate and work on YouTube videos, that was Med School Insiders, and you wanna start a second company, that's Mem, and you're talking to your attending about doing some AI with uh, image reading, third company, and also working on research and trying to boost up your CV, because then you just don't sleep, and then you're sleeping three, four hours a night, and you do that week after week after week, and your body just, it's not gonna be happy. And that's what we call workaholism. Don't recommend. Again, kudos to Rachel. Best of luck to her. Wishing her all the best. My friends, let me know what you think with a comment down below, and I'll see you in that next one.